All right, and welcome to the fourth episode of Further Inquiry. Today, I'm joined by Dr. John Paul Hemke. He is a historian and retired professor of history at the University of Alberta. He has written a number of books on Ukrainian history. Today, we are going to be talking about Ukrainian clergy during World War II and the Holocaust. So, Dr. Hemke, how are you today? I'm good. It's a nice day. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. I know you had Canada Day up there, so I'm good to have a celebration, I suppose. Yeah, but I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but let's get let's get into it. Um, for our audience, can you go a bit into what specifically got you interested in studying Ukrainian history? Oh, well, that there's many kind of key moments in that, but the first is that you know my my uh, mother died when I was a little little eleven months old, and my father brought his mother to raise me, and she was um, an immigrant. Uh, she had been a peasant in the old country. She spoke with an accent. Her English wasn't very good. And uh, I was always trying to figure her out. Uh, you know, when I would ask her where she came from, she would say Austria. Austria, she said Austria. And But I looked on a map of Austria and there was no you know, no Lemberg in it where she said she came from. Anyways, curiosity, I eventually discovered through an aunt that they came from Ukraine. And uh, that was uh, probably the first thing that I began to get interested in what was Ukraine and, and uh, what, what was its story. And so I spent a lot of time reading, even then as a kid, like 12 years old, 13 years old, books about Ukrainian history. So that would be one moment. And then <clears throat> another moment would be when I was a little bit older, not much older, and I wanted to go to a seminary. I wanted to become a priest. And although I had been baptized in the Roman Catholic faith, uh, I knew that canonically I was really of the uh, uh, Greek Catholic, Ukrainian Greek Catholic uh, faith. So I entered the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Seminary, and there I learned a great deal, uh, really uh, perfected, uh, or at least made progress on my language skills. I uh, learned a, quite a bit of Ukrainian history through the lectures that were being given. And, um, but then eventually I left the seminary. <clears throat> I went to the University of Alberta, I mean, excuse me, excuse me, University of Michigan. And uh, and their professors kind of noticed me, and um, I began really very uh, taking courses and uh, working with professors who were in East European, Balkan, and history, and also classics because I was very interested in philology and in. Uh, Greek texts at that time in my life. And I had thought of becoming a linguist because I was very interested in languages and the way they developed. But that was a time when Noam Chomsky, Chomsky was dominating the linguistic scene. And I really couldn't understand what the heck he was talking about. So um, I kind of drifted and began taking history courses. I never thought of myself as a historian, but I began taking history courses. And all of a sudden, uh, historians, uh, professors um, were giving me good marks and they were talking with me and, you know, I'd be interacting with them regularly. And then I didn't know what to do next. You know, I was en entering towards my senior year at the university. And I had a good friend, and still a really good friend. Uh, who was a graduate student in history. I didn't even know about that. And I, I can remember the conversation very clearly. I said, Roman, that was his name. I said, Roman, how do you survive? What do you, what do you live on? He says, well, I'm a history graduate student and I get scholarships and grants to write history. And I said, what? They pay you to do that? And um, he said yes. And so I entered graduate school. 
at the <laughs> University of Michigan. I was also accepted at Harvard, but um, I, I had a, two interests. One was in like the 19th century, and for that, Michigan was best. And the other was in uh, my other interest was in the sort of 17th and 18th centuries. And that was what, what I've what I'd done if I'd gone to Harvard. But I chose the 19th century, stayed in Michigan, and uh, found that I flourished. And in fact, that I really like history, and that it's. Uh, uh, and then I'll just say one more one more moment. I I have fooled around with various theories of history. Uh, I eventually read uh, an analytical philosopher by the name of Arthur C. Danto, who said, you know, history gives us a special kind of knowledge. It's narrative knowledge. It's not um, the same kind of analysis that you will find in medicine or uh, in uh, uh, philosophy or social sciences. It's narrative. And I, when, once I embraced that, I found that my life was very... Um, it flowed very easily because I I like to think about things. I like to read about things. I like to try to figure out what happened. I like to try to be very balanced. I try not to let politics obscure me anymore. Sometimes I used to be kind of doctrinaire. Try not to let nationalism obscure me anymore. I just try to try to figure out what happened and um, how it happened. So that's how I got into Ukrainian history. And I know I knew the I knew languages. I I could read I can read Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, German, all of them, and more or less close to how I read English. Uh, and then I have knowledge of uh, quite a few other languages as well. Well, quite quite the story. <laughs> and I wasn't even aware of, like um that you could get paid like um to to write history. I, I thought like you that's more of like a professor's thing. <laughs> so I, as at one time I thought about becoming a historian. But um, moving on, now getting into the heart of the matter, um, prior to the uh, German invasion of uh, Ukraine, what was the relationship like between Ukrainian Orthodox and Ukrainian Catholic, meaning both both the Roman Rite and the Greek Rite? Um, what was the relationship like between the Orthodox and the Catholic clergy in Ukraine at that time? Okay, the biggest tension was between the Ukrainian Catholics, the Ukrainian Greek Catholics, and the Polish Roman Catholics. Uh, but that was just a reflection in religion of the national conflict that was going on between Poles and Ukrainians in that era. <clears throat> and um, as far as Ukrainian Catholic and Ukrainian Orthodox relations were concerned, uh, they were geographically kind of distant. The um, Greek Catholic Church was located almost entirely in Galicia, and there are very few Orthodox in Galicia. And uh, in Volhynia, which was in the Polish state, and other areas of the Polish state of the interwar period, there were Orthodox. And generally speaking, the um, biggest problem with the Ukrainian Orthodox was their conflict with the Polish Roman Catholics, who were taking churches from them. And um, Ukrainian Greek Catholics actually protested this. So relations between Ukrainian Greek Catholics and Ukrainian Orthodox were relatively amicable uh, in the interwar period before World War II. All right. Um, well, it's a shame to hear that, that their churches were, the Orthodox churches were being taken away. But um, now, obviously, at, the, at this time, um, I. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Ukraine was under the control of the Soviet Union. So did the Soviet Union exert any control over the churches and the clergy? Well, first of all, not all of Ukraine was in the Soviet Union. Ah. Parts of what are today Ukraine were in Czechoslovakia and in Romania uh, and, of course, in Poland. And so, uh, and even uh, um, maybe a few new little bits of Hungary. So, um, the Soviet Union is a totally different story. There were no Greek Catholics in the Soviet Union. They absolutely were not allowed. They were totally abolished. 
As for the Orthodox, there were a whole series of Orthodox churches in the Soviet Union. There was the Russian Orthodox Church, the main religious organization of Russia. But then there was a renovationist church or a, um, um, there was a, that, that's a kind of radical version of orthodoxy, tried to trim away some of the um, uh, old um, uh, rules of orthodoxy. Just for as an example, yeah, an orthodox priest can be married, but if his wife uh, perishes or dies, then uh, he can't remarry. But in this renovationist orthodox church, they allowed marriage and a whole series of little small concessions to human failures. Uh, the Soviet regime persecuted. There was also a Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church, which at first the Soviet regime uh, supported and in fact tried to use it as a tool against the Russian Orthodox Church. But in the end, all the churches were persecuted. Ukrainian churches, all the Ukrainian churches were abolished in the Soviet Union, and only the Russian Orthodox Church had hardly any signs of life uh, by the late 1930s. Most of the bishops were arrested. Many, many, many priests were arrested. Many were sent into exile. It was a suffering church. Well, that's a shame to hear. Um, now, did Ukrainian clergy themselves like identify as Ukrainian or do they mainly think of themselves as Russian? Oh man, that depends where in, let's say outside the Soviet Union, um, Ukrainian clergy as such identified as Ukrainian. The, um, the Orthodox Church in, in uh, before World War II was the po was an autocephalous Polish church. It was a church of Poland. There were Ukrainians in it, and there were some Russians in it, or people who identified with the Russians. But basically, in that part of the world, uh, Ukrainians had a strong sense of national identity. In the Soviet Union, the churches were, I would say, more ambiguous, and the clergy more ambiguous. To one extent, they were Russian. To another extent, they were Ukrainian. Uh, individuals would um, kind of navigate those two national identities among the clergy. Uh, it could be very well that clergy was sent from Russia and that they were actually Russian, uh, or Ukrainians who assimilated to uh, uh, Russian language and Russian culture because that was what was going on in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. But it, some of them were, were still aware of their Ukrainian heritage. All right. Um, now, was Ukrainian nationalism or desires for independence espoused by any of the clergy in whatever parts of like um, what consists of Ukraine today at that time? Yes, I think that uh, in the entire Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and many of those Ukrainians who were active in the Orthodox Church were for the independence of Ukraine. Now, who at this time, like um during the interwar and during the during the war, um like who held like um leadership positions in both the Orthodox and and uh, Catholic churches in Ukraine at that time? Well, in the Ukrainian Catholics, the Greek Catholics, the leadership was a, a very uh, rather magnificent individual uh, by the name of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky. He was actually from the Polish aristocracy, or the Polonized Ukrainian aristocracy, uh, very wealthy, uh, very upper class. And uh, he was the leader of the Ukrainian Greek Catholics. I mean, there were other bishops there, but he was heads and shoulders of, of above everybody else. Very, very uh, charismatic. Um, and generous man. He he put a lot of money just into public uh, charities, such as a public um, hospital that people could go to and not necessarily have to pay. Uh, he founded a museum. He, he just did a lot of good stuff. In Soviet Ukraine, 
uh, leaders changed quite quickly back and forth because there weren't much. The, the Ukrainian churches there did not last long. Um, the major figure in the Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church was uh, Metropolitan Vasil Lipkiewski, who no other Orthodox would recognize as valid because uh, they couldn't get a bishop to, or, to ordain him a bishop. So they just had the priests and some of the laity lay hands on him and made him a bishop. But this is not allowed by Orthodox canons. Then, uh, let's say by about 1923, the leader of the church was the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, because all the Ukrainian Orthodox were now under the Moscow Patriarchate, although there was no patriarch. The uh, patriarch had been uh, uh, had died, and he was not replaced. And in the, and there was a, a hierarch called Sergius Sergei who ran the Orthodox Church. And he was constantly trying to find a that fine line between not offending the communist atheistic leadership and serving the faithful. It was a very difficult task. Oh, I imagine so. Um, now, 1939, obviously, the uh, war um, begins in Poland. And then in 1941, um, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union begins. Now, when the invasion of uh, when the German invasion began into uh, Ukrainian populated areas, um, how did the Ukrainian clergy react? Were they welcoming of the Germans, or were they opposed to the Germans, either in an indirect way or a direct way? Um, well, there was kind of you know the. Uh, the clergy is composed of many different individuals with many different viewpoints. Uh, but the leadership, let's say Metropolitan Andrei Shepitsky, um, to a certain extent, he welcomed the Germans. And most of the clergy welcomed the Germans because the previous 21 months, they were under the atheistic Soviet regime, and which, you know, uh, taxed the churches heavily, tried to drive them out of business, as it were, uh, arrested clergy, and uh, persecuted the church. So when the Germans came, it seemed like it might be an improvement. And um, so the Metropolitan Andrei Shepitsky welcomed the Germans in a pastoral letter, but also said that he hopes that the Germans will, uh, uh, will um, honor the civil rights of everybody regard, regardless of ethnicity or religion. It was a very important statement at that time. And the um, Ukrainian Orthodox, um, some of them also welcomed the Germans. Uh, I, I would say most of them did uh, because um, they, they had also been under the communist regime and, and were looking for liberation. And also I have to point out that the normal practice of the Catholic and Orthodox Church are to make do with the regimes they, fi they find themselves under. In other words, they don't instigate uh, opposition. They just try to find a modus vivendi with the authorities. They even tried to find out with the Soviet authorities, and uh, which of course was not very successful. But and with the Germans, they thought they would they might do better, although um, not as well as they hoped. Now, like to your knowledge, did like do the churches maybe have like some greater degree or even a lesser degree of freedom under the Nazi occupation? They had a greater, much greater degree of freedom. Uh, then in the Soviet Union, yes, many churches were open uh, when the, when the Nazis came in, and uh, the Germans came in, and as a result, um, uh, and and the Germans, of course, did not conquer that much of Russia, but they conquered all of Ukraine. They occupied all of Ukraine, 
So Ukraine became a place where many churches were open. And after the war, um, 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 the b major, the largest number of churches were in Ukraine within the Soviet Union because they'd been opened during the war by the Germans. Not by the Germans, by parishioners, but with German allowance. On the other hand, German policy towards the churches was also restrictive in certain ways. Um, they would not allow any discussion of unity between the various branches of the Orthodox churches because they didn't want to have any organization that was too powerful. So, you know, divide et impera, as the Latins say, divide and conquer. Mm. Now, um, I guess during this time, like, um, were there any clergy in either church um, that who held um, to Nazi or fascistic ideals or yes, even anti-Semitic anti ideals? Yes, there were some. There were some. Uh, and you have to cast yourself back into the 1930s when, in fact, fascism and related movements were very, very popular. I would say they're sort of like uh, the alt-right today, um, you know, which has uh, captured so many people across the globe. Well, that was the case in the 30s with uh, fascistic ideas. And... You know, clergy were no different than anybody else, really. Young clergy went to the seminaries, but they were plugged into the politics at the time. They had friends. So, yeah, so some of them came out of this experience, you know, out of their uh, peer group, um, believing in anti-Semitic or fascistic ideas, yes. But I, I don't think you can say it was a minority, of the, a majority of the clergy. Like um, what like what would be like some specific specific examples of like of a clergy who like who have like to these ideals like any like names you can think of? Oh yeah, uh, so there was a, a priest Irene Nazarko who published anti-Semitic texts. Not a lot of them, but he published them, and um, and he later became a very important church historian, actually, after the war, and was um, an important figure in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Uh, but, that, you know, I'm talking about somebody who came to these views uh, fairly early, uh, that is before the war broke out. You know, and, and once the war breaks out, a lot of things change. And a lot of people are drawn in to the Holocaust because the Nazis, uh, I mean the Germans really, uh, want to draw them in. So uh, I'll give you some examples of, of that when, when you're ready to talk about the war time. Sure. In fact, I was going to get into it like I'm right now. Like, um, now, when did like the Holocaust begin specifically in Ukraine? Did it begin like at the time of the German invasion? That's when I, I, that's when I, I say yes. Because, you know, a lot of the Holocaust uh, literature, a lot of Holocaust history is written from a West European perspective. And for them, the Vanze Conference in January of 1942, that's sort of the beginning of the, uh, the Holocaust. Uh, but no, they come into Ukraine, the Germans come into Ukraine, and within, within about a month, month and a week, they kill something like 20,000 or more Jews. So that's when the Holocaust begins in Ukraine. And then as the Germans march eastward, they kill 20,000 in, um, in uh, one city and so forth until they get the cave, and they kill 33,000 Jews in, a, in one operation. So I, I date, I date the Holocaust in Ukraine from 23rd of June, 1941. Uh, it's not, a, not all historians agree with that, but I think that's because they look at it from a West European perspective. Well, either way, it's still, still horrific carnage. Um, now, 
Were there any clergy, to your knowledge, who were directly or indirectly complicit with uh, wartime or Holocaust atrocities? Okay, no, no case where there was direct uh, involvement in the atrocities. But now, I know of a number of cases of indirect complicity. So, you know, and the other thing I have to say before I go much further, Alex, is that it's really hard to imagine what the, what the German occupation was like, how much they promoted anti-Semitism, and how much people, you know, now that the laws were against the Jews, how many people just believed that they had to follow the laws? You know, it's very hard for us to imagine a society where it was considered perfectly normal to uh, turn in Jews and have them deported. And I'm sure not everybody understood that they were deported to death camps. And it was, it was an evil time. I've, of all the times I've ever studied, that is the most evil time I, I know. Um, and indirect complicity, I can name numerous cases. Uh, not maybe numerous, but I can name some cases. So one example is uh, from uh, July of 1941. The uh, Germans instigated what they called the Padura days in uh, like the 20s or mid-20s of uh, July 1941, in which there was a massive roundup of Jews, and then they were killed uh, in really terrible ways, sometimes with hammer blows to the head and stuff like that. It was, oh, just horrible, absolutely horrible. They called it the Pilura days. And, um, you know, you, then I found I find a document where a priest is upset that some people weren't arresting these Jews. Uh, who was it? Somebody was letting them go instead of arresting them. And he said, "Now you can You have to take them to the to the prison." Um, so you know, for him, maybe he didn't know what was happening to those Jews, but um, you know, uh, he certainly was responsible for reporting on people who weren't turning Jews in. So I consider that an indirect complicity. But let me just give you another one. Um, there was a Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox bishop, uh, Rehori, uh, uh, bishop of, of Vinnytsia. And um, in 1943, um, some victims of the 1937-38 terror were being exhumed by the Germans in Vinnytsia. And so all these, must have been about something like 9,000 people, something like that, that had been killed by then, NKVD, in uh, the late 30s. Now they were being um, exhumed and laid out for everybody to see. And the bishop, Rehori Ohichuk, uh, he gave a very anti-Semitic sermon at the funeral for the Vinitsa victims, which I'll read. My dear sons, Arise from your graves and ask that bloodthirsty executioner, the father of all toilers. Why did you drive us into your cursed collective farm properties and acquire our good grain for the dinner table of your Jews? Because of our diligent work, which we performed for you and for your Jews? Or maybe because we took the milk away from the lips of our own children so that the children of your Jews could have butter? Why are you silent? You are silent because you know, you executioner, that these victims were killed for the same reason as Christ was killed, because of the truth. They died like sheep that fell into the clutches of predators. They got into Stalin's hands who used his excellent constitution to torture millions of people to death. Millions of Soviet citizens were locked into the dungeons of the NKVD and even their hands were tied behind their backs so that the Jewish executioners could do what they wanted with them. 
So I think that that was riling up the masses to an anti-Semitic frenzy. So there are cases of that, cases of individual priests who gave anti-Semitic sermons. Mm -hmm. Now, who were like some clergy that uh, protected Jews and, and maybe some other minorities such as uh, Roma gypsies, like who were targeted by the Germans? Yeah, I, I don't know about much about the, um, the rescue of the, of the Roma. I haven't seen much information on that at all. But on the, on, on the Jews, uh, I'll say that one of the few institutions that was rescuing Jews were the churches. Um, Polish nuns and convents, even in Ukraine, uh, rescued Jews. But the biggest and most um, most impressive rescue organization, or rescue operation, was led by Metropolitan Andrei Shuptitsky of the Greek Catholic Church, and uh, with his brother, uh, Klementi Shuptitsky, who was the head of the Studite Monastic Order, they had an incredible system for saving Jewish children. Now, they couldn't save much because the conditions were terrible. But they managed to save about 200 Jewish children uh, through very careful organization, very clever um, kind of subterfuges they used against the Germans. And what's kind of absolutely amazing is that of those 200 children that they were taking care of, not one of them was caught by the Germans. And only one of them uh, actually switched faith from Judaism into uh, Catholicism, Greek Catholicism. And that exceptional case was clearly somebody who uh, had a spiritual calling to the, to the, she became a nun, in fact. So wow. it was, there were, the churches were one of the few places of refuge for Jews, but they distrusted the Jews, sometimes distrusted the church for fear that they would baptize the children, which which they had to do, uh, baptize the children and um, draw them away from their uh, Jewish uh, um, heritage. Uh, but it's good to hear that, that's, that that number of children were saved. Um, do, do you know, like, of any um, Orthodox clergy um, who who were just as successful as Metropolitan Shevchitsky? No. There are cases, you know, there are cases where uh, a Romanian Orthodox bishop has saved Jews, but small numbers, not like an operation to save them. But there are also Orthodox clergy, Romanian Orthodox clergy, who, you know, spewed forth anti-Semitic sermons. You know, I, I would say that it's kind of hard to predict what people will do. I, I, I had a friend who, who was a Jew from Mukachevo, which is um, uh, now in Transcarpathian Oblast in Ukraine. And he had many friends who were Greek Catholic clergy. And when the communists wanted that clergy to leave the Greek Catholic Church and join the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, he knew many of these, these guys. And he said, I could never predict who would have you know, given in to the communists and joined the Orth Russian Orthodox Church and who was so, um, had such fortitude that he would stand up for his faith and become a confessor for the faith by being arrested and sent to the camps. So people are a little unpredictable. People who are like sometimes nationalists before the war, including clergy, uh, when they saw what the Germans were doing and what they saw what their fellow countrymen were doing to the Jews, they just absolutely switched altogether. Like famous case of Omoyan Kovts, who should be a saint. He was a member of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, not what I would call a philo-Semitic organization. 
Uh, but when the war came, and the and the militants of the nationalists wanted to do real harm, he stood up. He stopped them. He saved Jews. He gave them baptismal certificates. He did everything that was necessary. And he ended his life in Maidanek for his efforts. And even then, uh, before he was murdered, he had switched himself for somebody else uh, to be a prisoner. So, you know, there's heroics. Self-sacrifice. Yes. Yeah, it's, and that, and it's, you know, I would say we're all like that. We don't, and those of us who haven't been tested, we don't know what we would have done in a situation like that, do we? It's very, <laughs> we easy, very easy for me to sit here in my study and look out on the trees in front of me and think, well, if I was there, I would do this. But you know, I wasn't there. Yeah, I like I've, I sometimes have thought like, you know, it's easy to say that you know, you should do this or that, like um, when you're surrounded by a bloodthirsty regime. But of course, actions speak louder than words and actions are sometimes harder to to do. Yes, I agree with you, Alex. Now, did the hierarchies of both churches like issue any official policies or statement with regards to German persecution of Jews? Um. Again, we have a very exceptional case in Metropolitan, Andrei Sheptitsky, who was the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in Galicia, Ukraine. He could not come out with an official policy, like, you know, where he would say, do not do this to the Jews. But once he really got involved once he realized what was happening which would have been spring of 1942 because the uh, earlier murders just looked like excesses what he did is he issued pastoral letters you know letters that are aimed at all the clergy and faithful and in them without ever mentioning the word jew he completely told them to to avoid um, taking part in the persecution of the Jews, to hide the Jews, to feed the Jews. Um, I've done a, a detailed analysis of, a, of his pastoral letters from the wartime, and it's you know the one of the most striking ones, and everybody understood it when he when he released it. It's called "Thou Shalt Not Kill," which he uh, which he put out in 1942. And in it, it's, it's such an indictment of those who, people who are collaborating in the murder of Jews. So although he could not, because, you know, all, everything was censored under the Germans. You couldn't publish anything that didn't pass German censorship. But he did it in such a way that uh, it's just very clear that all the time he's talking about the Holocaust. And if... For instance, you read all those things and you were not aware of it. And I could point out a couple other things he did, one of which was that he protested directly to Himmler. He protested to various German agents about the murder of the Jews. He said, it's just like a, like waves of, of cliche, cliche, waves of, of ever larger uh, uh, waves of filth that are encompassing the morality of people under the Nazis, thought they might be worse than the communists. Uh, he actually came to the conclusion they were worse than the communists. And he, um, he informed the Vatican in detail about the murder of the Jews in Ukraine. And it was one of the most important informant, informants of the Vatican on the Holocaust. So there were, Quite a range of people, quite a range of people. He stands out in my, my estimation. Mm. Now, going into the uh, organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian certain army, can you like des describe that organization sp specifically as it relates to uh, Stepan Bandera and the atrocities like um, committed by them and maybe also clerical involvement? Like, what were, like, the motivations for any clergy participation in UNUPA? 
Um, there were clergy who were in Oum, but not very many. But there were some. Uh, and they, they just generally agreed in the fight for independence. And uh, some of them were anti-Semitic, I suppose. But generally, the clergy stood apart from Upa in particular. They Upa had no chaplains uh, at all. Um, and uh, there were two, two, two main factions of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. One was under Bandera, and the other was under Melnik. But both of them were, their militants were equally anti-Semitic and deeply involved in uh, pogroms uh, against the Jews and in uh, uh, infiltrating the German police, which was a major instrument of the Holocaust, of the Ukrainian police and German service. Uh, they were both involved in that, and both were involved in murdering Jews uh, after the final liquidations of the ghettos. So not very... Uh, to my mind, they're criminal organizations. Um, all right, then. Um, where was I? All right, now, moving on, like, obviously, like, on the, as the as Germany is losing the war, they, they, uh, they create uh, various, like, um, divisions, and they cons conscript uh, people in the surrounding countries. Um, they create um, the 14th SS Galicia Division, which consisted of Ukrainians. Uh, what was the religious background of, like, most members of that division? Like, did any clergy also serve as chaplains or soldiers? Yes. Okay. Um, mainly, they were um, Greek Catholics, the members of the Galicia Division, because Galicia was largely... Ukrainians in Galicia were almost entirely Greek Catholic. So that's what they, they would have been. Although, uh, in the later phases of the war, and, and in the immediate after, in the later phase of the war, really, uh, some former policemen and Schutzmannschaften from eastern Ukraine uh, went into the uh, division because um, they had police and um, other military experience. They often became like officers. But for the main, I would say 95, 90%, maybe more, were Greek Catholic. And they had chaplains. Metropolitan Shaptitsky uh, seems to have been in favor of forming the division, and he assigned chaplains to them. He would not assign chaplains to uh, UPA or OUN. Now, what were the, the motivations for uh, these for these men for joining the Galicia Division? Well, there'd be different different motivations for for different people, of course. But um, you know, the, they were recruited in the spring of nineteen forty three. And at that point, it was clear that the Germans were um, in danger of losing the war. That's after Stalingrad. And then within months after that, there's the major battles, tank battles of Kursk, Kharkiv, and uh, the Germans were moving westward. They were, in fact, going to be in... Um, they were moving westward. So in that situation, in that situation, there were several possibilities what young men, what could happen to young men. So you could be sent for forced labor into Germany. So there was a large group of uh, population from the Eastern territories of Europe who were sent into Germany as forced laborers. So some tried to avoid that. The, there was also pressure on young men to join UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. Uh, but that was 
uh, very risky, very radical move. Uh, some people, like my, oh, let me say, the other thing that could happen is the Russians could come in, or the Soviets could come in, sorry, Soviets could come in, and they could draft you. And if they drafted you, you'd get little training, you'd be cannon fighter, you'd be dead real soon. So, uh, and, and my relatives, my closest relatives, what they did is they hid in the woods just so they could avoid all these pressures to join one or another army. And some people went into the division, often on the advice of their fathers, who felt that this was a, a legitimate um, military unit uh, that could eventually fight for Ukrainian independence or at the very least um, keep order um, as the Germans retreated and the Soviets came in. So there are many motivations of that kind. Simply, where do you go? Do you want to go in the Red Army and die, or do you want to go to the woods and try to hide? Do you, you know, do you want to join Upa and that's that's real risky, or you know what? Or do you want to go for forced labor? Because young men were at a premium; everybody was trying to get them. So, uh, for some people, this seemed to be the most desire of the least abominable uh alternative mm. yeah because from what i've read in the past like um it sounded like um that like at least some, some of them were motivated to uh use their use uh the military experience they they would gain with uh with the ss to essentially create uh like a foundation like i guess to eventually build like a military resistance to the to the soviets Yes. Yeah, that was a, you know, and nobody, nobody had a clear enough idea of what was going to happen. They really didn't. Um, when I look at uh, what, what the organization Ukrainian Nationalists was thinking in the uh, uh, summer of 1943, uh, 44, and into 44, uh, they didn't really have a clear idea of what was going to happen. And uh, I think that was normal. And the Soviets didn't have a clear idea about what what things were what was going on in Galicia. Um, the fronts kind of impenetrable in that way. You know, on one side or the other, you knew certain things. Now, like what um, atrocities were like the uh, the was the Galicia division involved in like. What did like most of like most of them commit uh, war crimes or Holocaust atrocities, or was it only just maybe a select few units within the Galicia division? Well, there were there were definitely s select groups or or individual groups that did commit war crimes. Um, probably in February of 1944, there was an advanced group of a couple hundred, I think, people from the division. They were sent to Broda. They were sent to Broda at the same time that the Germans were going to eliminate the last of the Jews who were still surviving in Broda, and they wanted all available personnel to take part in that. So although we don't have any definite record that uh, the Waffen SS Galicia took part in it, it's most likely that that's what happened, because that would be an available unit of the kind that the Germans would use for. Um, rounding up of uh, Jews for liquidations of ghettos. So that would have been a small group if it was involved, which is most probable. And then, um, and then in 1944, um, in the summer, uh, they were relocated after the disastrous Battle of Brode, they were relocated to Slovakia. And, uh, oh, but before that happened, the certain units within the larger division were involved in massacres of the civilian population of two Polish villages, uh, usually in, with the help of, of, of UPA. 
And then uh, I think the biggest thing they actually did, in my estimation, although very few people uh, seem to have understood this yet, was the suppression of the Slovak national uprising. They were sent to Slovakia to uh, suppress the uprising. And what's often neglected is uh, the fact that many, many Jews who were trying to survive in Slovakia fought in that uprising in order to save their lives. So when you were killing the partisans, you were also killing many Jews who were fighting for their lives. After the suppression of the uprising, there were about 19,000 POWs taken, prisoners of war. Um, and they were, about half of them were Slovak and about half of them were Jewish. All the Slovaks were sent to an ordinary prison of war camp. The Jews, about you know, ten percent of them were shot right on the spot after the war, after the suppression, and the rest were sent to the camps in, um, you know, in the Reich to be to be killed. So I think that's their biggest thing. And then, as the as the war was, as the front was moving westward from from uh, from Ukraine, a lot of people who had been deeply in German service and actually deep, uh, uh, very deeply involved in the Holocaust, uh, they fled and took positions within the division, um, kind of a way of hiding hiding their past. So those are the those those are the things. And I have to say that if you looked at any German division or any ger division in German service, uh, you would see that all of them were implicated in the Holocaust one way or another. Um, like, did did the chaplains or um, condemn the atrocities, or did they inform Metropolitan Chaptitsky of what these uh, Galicia Division uh, members were doing? No. Um, I don't even think they would have been able to, but they would not have considered the suppression of the Slovak uprising to be... Uh, an atrocity. They would have said these are communists. Well, that's that's a shame, unfortunately. Now, after the war, the 14th SS Division's veterans were relocated to other parts of the world with the aid of a uh, bishop named uh, Ivan Buchko. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, what were his reasons for doing so? Like, did, to your knowledge, did he hold to any Nazi or fascistic ideals, or and was he aware that some of its members were war criminals or Holocaust perpetrators? Uh, Ivan Buchko, bishop, was... Um, had no 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 pro Nazi proclivities. He, uh, in fact, was one of the most outspoken uh, hierarchs to condemn anti Semitism in Ukraine back in the 30s. Yet, uh, so no, he didn't have an ideological affinity at all to the Nazis. But uh, he was very involved in bringing Ukrainian displaced persons and refugees into, uh, into North America and other places in Europe. Out of the displaced persons camps, out of the POW camp in Rimini where the division was held in Rimini, Italy. Uh, so his was, uh, it was refugee work, and that's what motivated him. So then, I get. Would you say it's a possibility he knew that some of them, like, had like um, like some of them may have been war criminals, or he was that not really his concern then? I don't think he would have uh, known that or thought about it. You know, it's it amazes me, Alex, but a lot of people. It took a long time before the Holocaust and its meaning really sank in. Um. Even in in uh, Israel, right? Uh, mm -hmm. at, at first, they considered the Holocaust survivors to be deficient people. Deficient. Uh, they didn't fight back. They uh, probably saved themselves 
by being prostitutes to the Germans and stuff like that. This terrible anti uh, Holocaust survivor uh, moods in Israel at first. Um, in America, Canada, nobody thought much of the Holocaust, really. Uh, you know that they wouldn't allow many Jews to come into Canada after the Holocaust. None is too many, they said, Jews. Uh, so it took a while for people to under, understand what happened. And even in the case now, I mean, we're only, I think, beginning to really understand uh, the Waffen SS Division Galicia. We only have begun, begun to understand Aoun and Upa. Um, there's a very, very good book by uh, Peter Novak on uh, the Holocaust in American life. And he shows for how long it lasted that people didn't really understand what happened. Look at the Vatican after World War II. A lot of people in the Vatican were protecting former Holocaust perpetrators because they didn't, and they thought the Jews were looking for revenge, which was wrong to look for revenge. You know, so we really, you know, people took a long time to understand uh, what happened. And I think there's a couple turning points. First one would have been about 61 when the Eichmann trial occurred. And um, and in the same period, Raoul Hilberg finally wrote a major thesis on the Holocaust, uh, his destruction of the European Jews, a major work, often considered the pioneering study of uh, Holocaust studies it came out in the early 60s. It took a long time. And then, actually, the next thing that happened that was really important was the television program, The Holocaust, which was actually quite good uh, in terms of its historical accuracy. And after that comes the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., Holocaust monuments in Berlin and elsewhere. So to expect Ivan Butchko to understand what was going on uh, and, and who these people were. And I would say, particularly in the case of the division, which um, just seemed to be, you know, young men who, uh, who were on the losing side of a war. So I don't think he had any idea of uh, the possible moral gravity uh, of some of the members. And how would you find those members? How would you know that? What did he think of the Slovak National Uprising? Did he know the history of World War II? You know, I just don't think that he really, I think he's just motivated by taking care of refugees. Personally. Yeah, but like the reason why I asked that question is because I, I've seen someone who, see, I've seen an, an, an individual who is very rapidly anti-Catholic. Like he, essentially he labeled like on Buchko, like a, like a Nazi or something like that. So essentially like implicating like, you know, because he, he helped this, the division veterans be, re be relocated. And because some of them were war criminals, therefore that makes him like a, like a Nazi or something like that. Yeah, you know, you have a, you know, we, each, we each have our own perspective, I guess. I mean, I'm talking as a historian who studied that church and the people in it. Um, maybe I have a little bit more knowledge, but maybe my, uh, Maybe my estimations are off. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, wrapping up here, does the issue of a Ukrainian clergy, or I guess maybe Ukraine in general during the war and the Holocaust, um, play any role in the current war between Ukraine and Russia? Well, not so much the clergy, no. Um, but uh, Russia has instrumentalized the history of the uh, of the Galician division and of Aoun and Upa uh, as part of their propaganda that Ukrainians are all Nazis. But when you stop and think about, if you look at a map of Ukraine, all of those groups, the Galician division, and Oun and Upa were basically relegated to the far west parts of Ukraine. So how is all of Ukraine now Nazi? And wasn't that like 70 years ago? <laughs> you know, it's, no, it's just, yeah, it's played a part in the propaganda, I would say.
I don't think that, uh, you know, look at how the Russians behaved uh, in Bucha and places like that. Look at what happened to Prigozhin. Look at all the murders. I mean, what kind of a sin is it to unleash a war? Territorial ambitions. You know, I mean, so I don't think their propaganda is worth eating, personally. Actually, that that reminds me. Like going back, like um, what were exactly the uh, motivations of Un Upa? Like um, in general, like um, I guess Stepan Bandera's uh, particular ambitions or motivations. Well, their major thing was to have a Ukrainian state, an independent Ukrainian state. That wouldn't. That's a good. That's I think a perfectly legitimate and honorable goal. But. In their version, it would be a Ukraine for Ukrainians. And what they did is they ethnically cleansed and murdered the non-Ukrainian population. That's when they crossed the border from a uh, just cause into criminality. So they killed you know, Jews, Poles, uh, Russians, uh, Roma, uh, Czechs, uh, ethnic Germans, uh, in Ukraine. Mm. Now, like, I guess this this last question that I wanted to ask for a uh, priest friend, um, like, was there, like, any difference in relations with the Germans, like, between Western Ukraine Ukrainians and Eastern Ukrainians, like, particularly the clergy? Yes. Yes, there were some elements in the Orthodox Church um, when the Germans came in, um, the Ukrainian Orthodox, there were two Ukrainian Orthodox churches appeared under German rule. The Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, which is not the same as the one that existed in the 1920s or the one that existed in the 1990s. Uh, but it was tended to be very pro-German. You know that um, that horrible sermon I gave, I, I read by uh, uh, Bishop Rehori, That's the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. They tended to be uh, pro-German. And then there was the Ukrainian Autonomous Orthodox Church, and that was less pro-German and oriented a bit more on Moscow. So there were these kind of uh, differences, uh, and and um, I would say that the Ukrainian autocephalous church was more Ukrainian, and the Ukrainian autonomous uh, Orthodox church was more pro-Russian, and that determined their relations with the Germans. All right. Well, I think that's everything I wanted to ask. Dr. Hinko, thank you so much for, for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Well, it's nice. Thank you, Alex, for inviting me. And uh, I appreciate that you give me a chance to talk about issues that are close to my own heart. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hopefully we can correspond again sometime in the future. But until then, you have a wonderful day. You too. All right. Bye-bye.